All right, let's prove the Riemann Lebesgue lemma. So, this isn't actually the Riemann Lebesgue lemma. The Riemann Lebesgue lemma actually applies for, well, if you replace cosine of nx with, what is it, e to the i pi nx, or something like that. Basically, what you end up doing is you're taking the, um, it, 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 it's you you end up taking the Fourier transform basically this is really this is really a theorem in uh, Fourier analysis and yeah so you can learn that if you want but we're not learning it now this is a very simplified version of a very important theorem in Fourier analysis okay so let's do what they advise G, let G be a step function and then apply the previous exercise so let g be a step function, i.e. let g be the sum from j equals 1 to m of cj times the indicator function on the open interval from aj to bj. Now for any j, we have, let's compute the integral of, um, and we, here, of course, we're assuming that the open intervals from aj to bj are disjoint. So the integral from, let's integrate this function on the interval from aj to bj. So this integral of gx dx, well, on this integral by disjointness, this is going to be, or on this interval, it's going to be precisely this, this integral of cj times the cosine of nx dx. And now what we're going to do here is we're going to pull out the cj, but now we're going to use the transformation u is going to be nx and du is going to be n dx. So we get cj times the integral from a, um, we get n times aj and n times bj because of the transformation. Then we have cosine of nx, no, that's going to become u, and then instead of dx, we have 1 over n times du, so we get du over n, so we have cj over n out front, and then integral of cosine is sine, so we're going to end up with sine of u evaluated from naj to nbj, so this is going to be 1 over n times cj times sine of nbj minus sine of naj. All right, so what's going to happen as n goes to infinity? Well, this sine of nbj minus sine of naj sine can only take on values between negative 1 and 1, so this difference can only take on values between negative 2 and 2. cj is a constant, and, is, and 1 over n will go to 0. So this entire thing will go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Thus, if we look at um, the integral of g of x, times cosine of nx dx. This is going to be precisely the sum from j equals 1 to m of the integral from aj to bj of cj times cosine of nx dx. And then each of these sums, each of these integrals will individually go to zero as n goes to infinity. And we're taking a finite sum, and so this entire sum will go to zero as n goes to infinity. Really, this sentence, we didn't need to include it if we didn't want to because it follows easily enough, but I figured I'd write it out. All right. So for any step function, the integral of the step function times cosine of nx dx will go to zero. So next, given an arbitrary integrable function g
and given any epsilon greater than zero, choose a step function phi such that the integral of the difference between phi and g dx is going to be less than epsilon over 2. And this is possible by exercise 1.4.3, the previous exercise. Okay. And choose n large enough that or choose capital N large enough that the integral of phi times cosine of nx dx is less than epsilon over 2. And this is possible, and this, this must be true for all n greater than or equal to n, and this is true because we just proved that for any uh, step function, or for any step, or uh, yeah, any step function, this integral goes to zero, and so in particular the integral of the absolute value goes to zero. You could throw absolute values previously and everything would work out fine. So then, if we look at the absolute value of the integral of gx cosine of nx dx, this is obviously going to be less than or equal to, now we'll bring the absolute value signs inside and we'll also take this gx and subtract phi x and add phi x and still multiply by cosine of nx dx so then this can be broken up well when we break it up we're going to get a less than or equal to so be less than or equal to we break up the g minus phi mi plus phi we'll have one term which is the integral of phi minus g times cosine of nx dx. Right, because we had a phi minus g, I just moved the minus signs around, it doesn't really matter um, because we're taking absolute values. And I split this multiple, this multiple these absolute values up um, like this because the absolute value of cosine of nx is going to be less than or equal to 1. So that will be useful in the next step. So we have this left over, and now this is less than, we know the second term is less than epsilon over 2, and the first term, the cosine in there, is going to be less than or equal to 1, so the first term will be less than or equal to this thing, then we add that second term in there, but we also know that now this integral is less than epsilon over 2, and this is epsilon. And this holds, let me move down a little bit here, for all n greater than or equal to n. And hence, the limit as n goes to infinity of the integral of g x cosine of n x dx equals zero. Because for any epsilon greater than zero, we can choose and n large enough such that for all n greater than or equal to this capital N that we've chosen, the size of this integral is less than epsilon, which means that it gets closer and closer to zero as n increases, and that's what we need in order for this limit statement to be true. And so, yeah, um, when you prove this in more generality for um, Fourier transforms, this cosine of nx becomes e to the i pi nx or something similar, and then the integral ends up being the same thing, and so here we use the fact that the absolute value of cosine is less than or equal to 1, and in the more general proof, you just use the fact that e to the i x is always, abs an absolute value will always be less than or equal to 1, so it ends up being a very similar proof. And yeah, if you learn more about Fourier analysis, then you'll learn that, and if not, then you won't. But in any case, this is how you do this exercise.